Okay, we have a special episode today for two reasons. The first one is Emily Athena is here, somatic sex educator, sexual wellness coach, founder of Eros Spark. Am I saying that right? I said it wrong twice, I think, before. So um, she does interesting stuff, and I want to ask her about it. And Patricia Aguirre, all the way from Mexico, uh, via the good-looking men of France, is here. Um, many of you may know Patricia from our trauma courses, working with women, uh, with boundaries, Courage to Lead course, longtime collaborator, co-leader of the company, old friend, and in person for the first time in three years because we're teaching in Slovenia. Did I miss anything in your? Um, probably, but good enough. It's good enough for now. <laughs> I don't, I don't it's, good, wanna... it's good enough for now. And it's sort of more her topic. So I thought, you know, as, as you just arrived, let's get her on as well. And um, we're going to talk about some interesting things. So, Emily, let's start with your life story. What got you interested in the sexy stuff? What 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 was your route into your work? Mm, interesting. I think like most people, I had, you know, next to no sex sex education and just all the normal stuff, you know, get into relationships. It's great at first. You lose your interest in sex and you know, just wonder why and just all the normal stuff. But uh, my life before that was all dance. So I grew up dancing in ballet, then became a contemporary dancer, professional dancer, got into fitness, personal training, Pilates, all of that. Um, and then I got injured. And then, you know, this thing I was loved and was so privileged to do became uh, such a pain a literal pain, like literally pain for 10 years dancing on an injury. And so I reached a breaking point where I knew, you know, I can't keep doing this anymore. And that's when I sort of got into sex education in a very roundabout way through fitness, through uh, core and pelvic floor rehabilitation, led me into sex education, which led me into trauma resolution, which led me to finding a way to stay in the realm of movement because I knew that was my connection to my aliveness, even though it had become so dulled and painful over the 10 years. And by combining those things, sex education, trauma resolution, and somatic movement, I found a way to find pleasure in my body again and expression and to have movement be healing and pleasurable and my compass of truth instead of it being what it had been, which was, you know, a tool for profit and production. Mm -hmm. So that's really mm -hmm. how I got from there to here. Sex trauma and somatics. This sounds like three of the best things ever. Lot, lots to talk about. Um, who do you generally help at the moment? Give us an idea of sort of like a day in your life. Like, like, like how does it work? You're like coaching people, you're dancing with women. Like how does it work? Yeah, so I both have my private coaching practice where I work with folks one on one and I work with women, but I also work with men and I also work with couples and non binary folks. So that's, you know, there's some differences there, but um, we're more the same than we are different. I'll say that from working with people of different uh, genders and backgrounds and coming to me for different things. And then Aerospark is at this point, it's just for women. And these are classes that I teach where people come and it's not about what it looks like at all. So there's this real, um, you know, diversion from the world of dance and being oriented toward an audience or a mirror or um, an other and having it be about the aesthetic. And it's really all about what it feels like finding threads of pleasure in the body and we do that because, you know, people come to me usually with low desire. They want to want to have sex again, right? There's a wanting for the wanting, but you don't start with the wanting. You start with arousal. Arousal comes before desire, finding your turn on. Once you feel turned on, then sex sounds like a good idea, but you also can't force yourself to get turned on. So that's why we start with these simple embodied pleasures and finding pleasure in the body through um, guided, but also intuitive and um, free form movement. 
you know, turn on sounds like a thing you just turn on and off, doesn't it? You know? so right, the like, switch, yeah, the turn on, the turn off, so simple, you just shoot, shoot, but it's a little bit more you. complex than yeah. that. Anything jump out of you? Just sure. What would you say that's the things that happen or what's the thing that happens that women or people in general lose that spark or that one thing, as you said, and it sort of like disappears along the way? What do you find in common? Hmm. Well, often stress. But I think, you know, if you Google, like, why do I have low libido? Uh, you'll get answers like medication, hormone fluctuations, mental health issues, relationship issues. Yeah. And these are all true. These are all going to affect your libido, your desire for sex, all true. But what I found in working with people is that there's usually a deeper root that's below all of those things. And for most women, which is most of the people who come to me for low libido, it's not owning your sexuality. It's being socialized to, um, to believe that your sexuality is for someone else, your beauty, your aesthetic, everything is for someone else. And when you go through life with that um, belief, and usually it's a subconscious belief, people don't you know, believe that in their conscious mind, but that's how we've been socialized and raised. Uh, you can't freely give, right? Sex is generous and generative. It's this, this beautiful thing, but you can't freely give what you feel is being taken from you. And after so long, your body will say, no, absolutely not. We are not going to be taken from anymore. Even if like, you know, you have this loving partner who's not trying to like consciously take from you. It's just this, this like underlying insidious dynamic that's been set up where the body eventually says no. And until you do the work to really own your sexuality and have it be yours again, only then can you freely like give and be generous and decide who to share that with. How does a woman or person uh, who has owned their sexuality look like? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, I've thought about this a lot as a person who has done this work and like is sexually empowered, you know, I'm making the air quotes for people who are listening. Um, there's no place of like arrival or perfection. Like I'm still going to override my body. Sometimes I'm still going to not say the thing I want to say during sex. I'm still like, I'm still going to have all these little micro moments, but there's like a general sense of centeredness or ownership of, of my yes and my no that wasn't there before. And a connection to my pleasure and orienting toward my pleasure, both in and out of sexual experiences that wasn't there before. You can feel it in others too, right? I mean, I can, that's pal palatable. If I'm next to you, who I, you, you missed the sort of cheeky look between us there, but as you said, you know, what is it like? And I kind of looked to Patricia because I would regard her as in that, that category. And like the difference between someone like you or someone who's just closed down, London, lawyer, you know, not in a body, tight or traumatized Berlin feminist, you know, that sort of the, sort of those bodies feel palpably different than someone who's gone through a process to reopen that sexuality, whether it's from trauma or not, right? Like, like that is noticeable. It's not just for, for guys, I think, right? You can feel that in other women? In other women? Yeah. Like how they move, how they feel. To me, it's obvious, no? Is it, is it obvious, Emily? <laughs> well, I, what I hear when I hear you speak, Mark, is like that level of protection that mm. so many people have up because they don't own their sexuality and have a clear ability to uh, use, use their yes and their no and be fluent in that way. There's like, there's the wall of protection that has come down to protect that person that feels so hard and rigid and inward and, and all of those things. And that comes up so much in my coaching work with women is like, there is this, this wall that comes up. And so the work is like, 
learning for the discernment to come from within and to have so much ownership and trust in self that that like wall isn't necessary anymore. And it's a process, but it's totally possible. And I guess there's something about just the world we're in, right? Like I talked to my wife about this and she deals and plays poker. And I'm like, okay, you spend all your time sitting still, deliberately not expressing yourself or moving your body <laughs> and competing around a table with 10 men. Like that's her world, mm -hmm. right? And that, that to me is a very exaggerated version of just the average office worker. Yeah, and it's like in that environment of the modern context of sort of industrial, non-cyclical, you know, competitive, disembodied world, like it's pretty hard for anyone to get in touch. I would imagine any kind of feminine flow anyway. Like, like it's, it's, that must be a challenge for you ladies, no? Yes, and, it, and it's been so unsafe for so many women as well. So that, that protection that like we learn to have is, is very necessary. And sort of that like tight disembodiment, you know, that's, that's a way to, that's a gift of survival. And so we don't want to like demonize any of those things, but, you know, to find the, the full aliveness and the full expression and the full like palette of humanness, like eventually, like, just like the work you do, you know, helping people resolve trauma and come back into their bodies. It's like, that is the work to find more pleasure, more expression, but the, the ways that our bodies protect us from what is unsafe, like is also honorable and beautiful. And yeah, you know, I think it's worth come back. recognizing that as a sort of honoring it, as you say, as a self-defense. And I, I guess we're going into the trauma territory here. And, you know, one thing I've learned over even just the last 10 years is just like how much trauma most women are carrying around around sex. And it's not like most blokes get exactly encouraged for it. Do you know what I mean? You know, when a little boy walks and says, says oh, my, why is my penis like this? It's most first direction kind of thing. It's not like most parents would say, oh, well done, you know? Or as a teenage boy, you start you know, liking girls. It's not like the teachers in school are really encouraging it or anything, right? So um, but there's, a, there's a lot of pain and healing around this topic. It's a wonder any of us are sort of feeling safe and open and relaxed enough to connect with anyone. Yeah. Yeah. How does what helps then in that context? I'll ask you both of this. Like, as you know, someone who isn't a woman, and I, I do see that not in every case, because there's plenty of boys who are abused and you know, and blah, blah. generally, like there is a difference in the level of um unwanted sexual attention, unwanted, you know, from a glance to a you know, full of soul or something more for. Like, how do you keep open and feminine and giving in that context, like without just going, you know, fuck this? Well, you don't, I think. <laughs> um, and, you know, just like any trauma resolution process, like you, you go through the therapy, you go through the process, but, you know, coming back into the body is part of the healing process not only to find like your pleasure again, but to find your, your instincts and your intuition and what was thwarted in those protective processes. You know, the words you couldn't say, the movements you couldn't do. And like coming back into the body is the healing process. And just knowing that, just know, first of all, knowing that, that, you know, the body is, while it feels like the safe, it feels like the unsafe place to be. It's also the place where the healing happens and just knowing that that takes time and, and you can repair and find your pleasure again and move out of this narrow box of what we think sex is like, Oh, sex is penetration. Uh, sex is for a man's pleasure. Like whatever ideas we have, when we can widen that narrow you know, sphere to include what actually feels good for you. And it's so individual, you know, it's, it's, it's such a beautiful way of um, finding our self-expression. And when we can do that, when there's actually something that you like on the menu, it's much easier to like want to have sex 
But if what you think of sex is this thing that like, doesn't feel good for you, well, like, of course you're not going to want that. And you're going to stay far away from that. What would you say, Emily, or what do you usually respond to people who are focused or focused on, let's say, I need the environment to change, or I need my partner to change in order for me to enjoy that type of sexual life that they want to create? Yeah, that's a tough one. I encounter that a lot. Yeah. Um, the only way for anything to change is for us to change, right? Like wherever we go, there we are. You could have an, you can move to a new city, you could get a new partner, but nothing's going to really be different until you become different. You know, I'm experiencing this in my relationships with my family. It's like, you know, these dynamics with my parents or whatever that have been set up over years and years and years. And I can't expect them to be the one to change. So I have to approach them differently. I have to make a different choice in order for the dynamic to change. And it's the same way, you know, with your partner and with sexuality. And I've seen it happen. Um, just a client I had recently, she came to me wanting to want to have sex with her husband again, very common. Um, but she had never self-pleasured before. She had never, you know, masturbated or given herself any sexual pleasure. And slowly we walked into that and she learned how to do that. And of course, her relationship with her husband changed, her sexual relationship with her husband changed from her finding her own pleasure and owning her own sexuality. So we just can't expect other people to do the work for us. Low libido is a surprisingly common thing, right? In the modern context. And mm -hmm. particularly, I just see with long-term long relationships, mm -hmm. seems to be incredibly common. Like, I won't talk about my life because it's not fair about my wife, but it's like, you know, I hear friends constantly say things like, oh, I haven't been laid in weeks or months. And, you know, I had one, one of my friends, I haven't had sex months in over a year. And I was like, what? <laughs> How does this person steal your husband? And, and then other people, oh, yeah, that happens, you know. And it, it's almost accepted, particularly in some cultures. Or is it just actually, you know what, we're not really designed to be in an erotic relationship with one person long term. You know, is that for those who are in monogamous relationships, just sort of how it is? Like there's this kind of idea that we would all like to be having the kind of sex life like we had in our first month or two months of meeting when we're, you know, 78 and da 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 da. Like what, what's your take on this without being idealistic or without writing anyone off? Yeah, there's a real Mm, philosophical debate there like are we meant to be monogamous or not and uh i don't know it's it's a choice we make and we get a lot of benefits from from making that choice and there's also any choice you make there's going to be some drawbacks um so i think what happens is just like we're always growing and evolving as people right we're always changing our sexual selves and our eroticism are always growing and shifting and changing. And trying to keep that the same as it was when you first got into a relationship with someone and expecting that to be the same years and years and years down the line, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're different, you have changed. And so the more that we can each have a, a real relationship with our sexuality and our eroticism, and really understand that and be true to that and let it shift and evolve and grow and change and do that together. I do believe, and I, I see it in people that they can keep their sexual connection strong and vibrant, and it's going to ebb and flow and dip and rise. And, you know, it's not going to be the same, but if you want to stay connected to that person and they're also committed to staying connected to their erotic self, like, you know, you can find that growth together. Yeah. And I don't think Derek might be saying this. One of the questions I really like is like, what do I like in this person now? Right. Mm -hmm. Cause it's so easy to take someone for granted when you've lived with them for a while. And sometimes I look at her and go, okay, I know like cognitively what I think is hot with my wife, but then it's like, when I look at her, it might actually be, Oh, I'm 
I'm not going to give examples. It's not fair enough. She's a private person, but it's like there's specific little weird things or something. Oh, that's, I never used to find that hot, but actually that's really hot. And that is, um, that's a shifting thing. Like, what do I like about this person now in reality, right here, right now, as a sort of yes. erotic mindfulness practice, I think it's quite, quite yes. helpful question I find. Yeah, because you're paying attention. You know, embodiment is so much about paying attention, right? To <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. You know, yeah. it's so much about paying attention to, to what we're noticing in ourselves. And so this relational attunement is what I would call that is about really paying attention to your partner. And I think, you know, people always want to know like, well, how do I, how do I become a great lover? And there's no tip, there's no trick, there's no technique because every body is different. The only thing it takes is the skill of attunement. And that's, that's the job, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's not necessarily an easy skill, um, but that's how you become a great lover. You attune, you attune to your own body and you attune to the body or bodies that you're with. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm gonna also play a bit with the question. Yeah. What usually happens when, when women, because a, a lot of women, and I guess a lot of people in general are very attracted to this idea of, oh, the way to that um, connection that they crave and that sexual connection that they crave is through doing my work, being attentive to what I'm uh, connecting to what my body, to what's happening in my body and therefore being able to connect with other. But what if the other person's not responsive? Is it, yeah. you're gonna do all the magic happen just by changing yourself or changing yourself enough so that you change the Drag other person? Drag them on a or a tango class or like, uh, I mean, it's gotta be mutual, surely though, right? Like there's gotta be some dance in that. Well, that's the thing. Like, do you have buy-in from your partner? to you know to want to do something different sexually like that is a conversation to have a hundred percent and i find that most partners you know so if i work with mostly women then you know in heterosexual relationships the partners are mostly men i find that most men like they're just down for whatever they're like what whatever i'm i'm cool like whatever's gonna bring you pleasure whatever's going to like, however I can like win and know what to do and feel good about myself in that, like you're having pleasure and you're having a good time. Like I'm down. We're and service dogs essentially. We're going to see a huge migration movement after the, this podcast is, is public into, uh, where are you, Oregon? Right? Oregon? No, <laughs> there's no men. She's not, she's this, no, it's Ashland. That's okay. It's not Portland. Shout out to all the non-men in Portland. Um, we like to insult Portland regularly on this podcast. It used to, used to be California, but we've, we've changed our ways. Um, okay, so yeah, um, but there's something in that. Like, I get that as a guy. It's like, okay, what do I need to do? You know, it's like, sign me up. Okay, what, how do I help? You know, what do you need? What do you need? Like, that is, that is a kind of question that I think like, but, any oh, half decent guys asking, surely. And I'll also say that you know, getting out of the, the narrow definition of sex that we have and expanding to, you know, other possibilities, other pleasure possibilities, it doesn't just benefit women. It benefits men too. Like, even though the way things are set up now, it's more oriented toward um, the male arousal trajectory and male pleasure, it's also not working great for men. Like, there's so much more potential there for for pleasure for connection for transcendent experiences so it really benefits everyone to redefine sex to try new things to slow down to feel more it's not just for the benefit of like female sexuality no and let's talk about the cultural piece it's a bit of an obsession on the show so much of modern stuff comes from the states obviously in our company the main trainers are german dutch Mexican and Anglo-Irish, right? They're the four main trainers in, in the company. So we, we can't really avoid it, right? Like culture will come up on the course we're about to do in Slovenia, no doubt, because some things will happen and I'll be like, oh yeah, that's an East European thing. And you'll be like, what the fuck, right? Or you'll be like, this is easy. And they'll be like, no, it's not. 
like in terms of pleasure and the body, like what what's something that comes up for you that might be kind of cultural piece here, or you've seen different because you've been traveling in France and you know Mexico, the States. Just recently, I've been traveling. I'm sure your clients, Emily, are from all over the place as well. Like, what's the cultural piece here? Because I feel it's quite strong, like in terms of how people relate to pleasure in the body. Well, here in the U.S., <clears throat> I feel like <laughs> we have two and we have two extremes. Mm -hmm. We have the puritanical. This could also be, you know, the religious, which is not just in the U.S., is in many different places. And then we have the pornographic. Okay. And so, you know, the extreme like um, repression and like almost the extreme like uh, demonstrate, like demonstrative, like the Olympics of like, almost like making sex, like a caricature. Like, yeah. And then, so neither of, neither ends of that spectrum are usually what people are interested in. It's like, Ooh, no, Ooh, no, but there's no, there's like no modeling for what, for what else, like what's in the middle. Neither is embodied so, either, right? Like, and you know, one's performative and the other one's repressive. Exactly. The other thing that occurred to me about the States and sort of modern on the sort of liberal side of things rather than conservative is everything the conservatives are connected with sex seems to be about reproduction. You know, it's a man and a woman and they have children and it's a family. And then on the liberal side, it's completely non-reproductive. So it's like, you know, you're shagging a plastic dolphin or it's two guys or it's abortion, you know, and all of these are nuanced issues, blah, 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 blah. But, and I'm not taking a side there. One thing that occurred to me though is the difference in emphasis on sort of reproductivity on one side being it's just sex and reproduction. On the other side, almost anti, like almost anti having children, which is kind of like, I have these conversations on this podcast with various people around sex and sexuality quite often, probably had about 30 or 40 of them. And almost no one mentions kids. Right, because they're from the liberal end of the spectrum. It's like, well, that's kind of what it was designed for in a way. And if not, to have the kids to at least pair bond the adults to not, you know, it's like, I like this person enough, but I'm not going to murder this baby. You know, it's like, it's very bonding. So I'm curious about this. I literally just came up with this yesterday. This reproductive either denial from the liberal side or sort of that's all it is from the conservative side. There seems to be something going on there that I... I don't quite get making any sense. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, that's, that's how we all came to be through sex, right? So <laughs> sex is for procreation, but if you think about all the sex that's being had all the time and how many times that, you know, creates a pregnancy and creates a birth, it's like, that's a, pretty small percentage, you know, the sort of gets in, into fertility. If a woman's having a, you know, a, a regular enough menstrual cycle, she can only get pregnant five days out of the month. Yeah. So there's so many other days in the cycle where you can have the sex and not get pregnant. So it could still be reproductive bonding, right? Just see what I mean? Like yes, the hell exactly. of a way of keeping a partner around male or female. Exactly. So that's, that gets into the question is, of, you know, another debate, like, is sex ever casual? Uh -huh. Because, you know, like the neurochemistry of sex, when we have sex, it's like, there's the oxytocin release, you know, the bonding hormones. And it's like, so even if your intention is to have, you know, quote unquote, casual sex or, um, you know, a one night stand or these kinds of things, there is still some, like a deep connection that forms you know, you are still having a deep embodied neurochemical love experience with someone. And I think to deny that is a little bit short-sighted. And it also doesn't mean you have to pair up with that person. Like you can be in full choice, but it's good to have informed consent about what's really happening in bodies when they have sex. I guess there's something in the conservative truth, because often in this polarization in the States, and we'll come back to maybe our own cultures in a minute, there's something that polarization 
where the, the conservatives deny that, you know, the pleasure of sex, the fun of sex, the fact it's not all about having babies, right? This sort of puritanical side. And on the liberal side, there's a denial of something like the power of sex, like you just described, or the sacredness of sex. Mm-hmm. And there's that sort of, you know, it's all sport, it's all casual, it's all fun. And this denial of the sort of life side of it, that it is somehow linked to life. You know, if you're, I just saw a newspaper article about um, someone who's been arrested in Britain for having sex with tractors. Now, yeah, he's having sex with tractors and he's been arrested for it. Now, that's pathological. I don't care how fucking liberal you are. Even in Portland, having sex with a tractor. Do you know what a tractor is? To say that in America, it's like a John Deere, like a machine. That's, uh, like that's pathological because it's so not linked to reproduction. Something's gone a bit weird in that. And that trend towards the completely non-reproductive also seems to be in culture in quite a big way now. Even if someone, I would consider myself on the far end of liberality when it comes to sexuality, right? Like in my attitude, it's pretty fucking liberal about sex. Less about tax, more about sex. And it's, even I'm now going, maybe I'm just getting old, getting middle-aged. Even I'm going, whoa, this is a bit far. You know, even as someone that's fought for gay rights and, you know, been in open relationships, blah, blah, blah. I'm sort of going, something's gone wrong in the modern world around sex that it's become so divorced from any kind of reproductive route, as well as love connection sometimes, right? Like, tin- yeah. love happens. I think that's the, that's the porn influence. That's like taking sex and like constantly upping the ante and upping the ante and making it more and more and more like um, just kind of why, like the Cir- like Cirque du Soleil. It's like, well, what else can we do? And what else can we do? And next, you, have you had a young lover recently? Had like, they're, they're, they're so porn, they're so porn recently. I'm like, whoa, Wait, things have changed. Yeah, porn is the worst sex education. It's great right. entertainment. Like, if you like that, that's what we need to remember. Like, porn is a movie, it's actors, it's entertainment. It's not that different from like, you know, watching Netflix or something. It's, it's make believe. But when we use that for education or educational purposes and to learn what to do, that's when we really go wrong. And that's where, you know, culture has failed us and sex education has failed us because uh, we don't learn anything. And so it's so easy, like porn is so accessible that that's where, you know, most young people turn to learn about sex. And it's just, it's that's not, not that's nice. yeah, most average people are not, you know, porn actors are not the Olympics of sex. And like our bodies aren't like ready to do those things and usually don't want to. And that's where a lot of trauma comes in is like doing too much too fast, you know, in What's sex. the definition of trauma, actually, isn't it? Too much too fast to all. Yeah. Have yeah. you seen yeah. a Mexican piece? Do you want to bring that in just on a sort of cultural? I mean, I was just thinking Ooh. alongside this uh, effect of pornography, and I, I don't think people might relate it directly to pornography, but it's definitely a culture that's created alongside that, which is casual is good. And I don't mean morality, but it, you're not cool if you're mixing emotions, right? And it's, oh, oh, women cannot do that. Like, you should be able to have sex without emotions when it's in, even in a sense of biological wiring that's happening when you're connecting to someone. And then, I mean, I think this happened like maybe 20 years back. There was sort of like this idea of, you know, keep it casual and no feelings attached, no strings attached, all of these ideas thrown out so easily. Also dating apps contribute to this idea. Oh, dating apps have ruined the, the whole, the whole what's so-called sexual marketplace. The no drama, yeah. right? What drama means having emotional needs, like regular uh, respect as humans. But then there's sort of like this veil around this where it's cool to be able to do that. And I've seen a lot of uh, young women try to fit that model because that's what's good, that's what's acceptable, and that's what men well, it's want. It's also a statistical thing. Like yeah. If you're using dating apps, it means there's less couples happening in this. Mm-hmm. I just point people to uh, my friend Chris Williams' podcast. He's got had several guests on talking about the effects of technology and how it creates a very different, um, because of the choice factors, it sort of multiplies that most women will be fighting over a very small group of guys. Yeah. 
um, there's a, now a large number of young men that don't have sex at all and a large number of women who are essentially only have the availability of sort of casual sex where they're, they're you know, being used and not really connected with. And it's that, that's almost a technological shift as much as anything. Anyway, next clip. Um, I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges, culturally speaking, is this idea of being able to, uh, first of all, break through the religious, moral, cultural aspect of saying, I like sex, <laughs> just actually expressing it. I mean, I've, I've even seen people who actually go to workshops but can, and, and are willing to uh, step into the work, but will not say the word. Like, we not. It's Catholic country here, by the way, as well. So. Yeah. Like the word sex, it's like, oh, that, that course, that thing, or, you know, shine away even from actually voicing it. So it's, it's super radical to take that step, let alone actually take the steps to living that kind of life with their partners. And like I, I said this as a joke about, you know, a lot of women migrating. If you say that there's lots of men who are open and willing to, yeah, whatever you you want, we're, I'm open to that. Mostly what you find culture is like, no, like why do you need something else? And that's weird stuff. And that's don't, don't move what works for me. And that's one of the, I guess the second barrier that women face big time when doing this type of work. Mm. Cool. Emily, are there any sort of major topics of yours we, we haven't um, touched upon? I mean, there's was, was lots there. I know you sent me some good questions and things. So anything you think, oh, I should really include that in the last 10 minutes? Um, I think we touched on a lot. Um, you know, maybe getting back to this idea of embodied pleasure, I think could be a good way to kind of bring things back and you know we st staying in the cultural realm but just shifting from sex to pleasure right we have all these ideas about pleasure and usually they are that it's guilty right we learn like when people think of the word pleasure they immediately think oh guilty pleasures so we think it's guilty we think it's frivolous we think it's self-indulgent it's something we can have when all the work is done. But the way pleasure actually works in the body is it is your resource for stress. It is the counterpoint to stress. So while we're all living in these like hyper stressed lives, like not saving the pleasure for when we're done, but starting to weave pleasure in, in small ways throughout the day is, you know, another form of like meditation is like taking pleasure in from your environment and all the ways that it's always available to you and letting that be the inroad into your body. So when there is so much stress and pain inside, it's like, if you use the inroad of pleasure, it's a safer way in. And then it's like a life raft. When you start to feel the pain, when you start to feel the things that don't feel good in your body, letting whatever feels good or neutral be the, the resource to be able to feel everything that's in your body. Even the framing we have of embodiment or mindfulness, like, you know, talking about paying attention, like paying, it sounds like you're giving, you know, have to put some money down, you know, and attention, even sounds like tension, it sounds awful. You know, it's not like suckling on the teat of pleasure of the body. Like, it's like, there's something in like, even how we frame, I'm doing mindfulness now, it's hard work, as opposed to, wow, I'm really enjoying myself. And as you say, that's, that's resourcing. Yeah. One thing I notice when I'm stressed, I tend to seek pleasure more, and that can be a little bit dangerous, actually. Like, for the first time I was in Ukraine recently, I was just eating a lot of sugar and stuff. You know, it's easy to kind of seek pleasure as a, as a way out. But um, mm -hmm. it seems like we don't give pleasure enough credit in the embodiment world because of the strong kind of Buddhist influence, which is <laughs> kind of- Yeah, when I started doing um, somatic practices in college, like, you know, it was all about this like deep pain attention, but there was no orientation to like what felt good. It was more like a science experiment. And it was all in the name of becoming a more articulate mover so that you could 
look cooler when you went back to dance. So it had this real like um, sort of production driven purpose to it. And so I just, you know, there became a point where I just couldn't do that anymore. And I lost all interest in that. And now it's really about, you know, building the habit of pleasure just because it's your birthright, because you get to feel good. And, you know, a lot of that like religious cultural thing about, oh, you'll feel good in the afterlife, suffer, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, you're, you're, it's your body. Like you're allowed to feel good. You're allowed to feel pleasure in there. So a lot of what I'm doing now is helping people build that habit and giving themselves permission to like find what feels good, like breathe that through their body, let that be like, a, um, you know, a beautiful moment in their otherwise like intense, stressful day, because that's, that's what we're working with now. Cool. Sometimes <laughs> I feel like I'm the only guy enjoying the gym when I'm in there. I'm like, why is no one else smiling? I really, <laughs> there's a machine where you have to like pull down cables and you're like, Whoa! <laughs> I do, I'm just in like massive, like, ah, I'm loving it the whole time. Everyone else is like doing their reps really miserably. That would be me. That would be you doing miserable reps. No, I love it. That's not me at the gym. But that's me, right? We all enjoy it. There's other things that you do. We enjoy different things. That's why I don't go to the gym. Because you don't enjoy it. Yes. Yeah? Okay. okay. Schwarzenegger used to enjoy it. He took back the pump. You have to get the pump. It feels like orgasm in your body. Love it. It's a great clever Schwarzenegger. Yeah, like f finding um, like pleasure in the work. Like that's a thing too. Like I, Mark, I go to the gym and like started putting weights on my back and doing squats and like, yeah, there is like, and now I can like orient to like, well, what feels good about like that like effort and like that's now fun because I can choose to when I want to do that. And I'm no longer forced into a nine to five where I have to like push past my body's limits all the time. It's like, no, I'm in choice and I can really enjoy that effort as opposed to uh, struggling through the effort because I have to. Cool. Well, let's mention some resources and then we'll move to your, your personal ones. Um, in this field of sort of pleasure in the body and overcoming low libido, who do you rate who's out there that you think's worth pointing people to. We've had a number of cool guests on. Caleb Bohem's impressed me a number of times on, on the conferences and things. Mm -hmm. Anyone you two want to point people to in these this kind of areas? I think the book Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski is it's a great foundational. Title. It's yeah, it's really foundational. If you have low libido um, or are confused about what's going on with your sexuality that will let you know what's up and make you feel normal and okay. Cool. Any other teachers or books or um, vibrators? Anything? It's going to be a little biased, but go to, go to your therapist. <laughs> go to your therapist. Okay. Go to your therapist. It's like, what's going on here? To be the fastest way to clear the pathway to pleasure. Awesome. Yeah. The therapist. I think the trauma, trauma work. Do the trauma work. Like, it's one of the ways I motivate my clients. I'm like, you will fuck better and have a better sex life if you do the trauma work. That yeah. is just a fact. Fact. Okay, mm -hmm. so we said the world's right. Um, awesome, Emily, where do people find you? Where do they go on the interweb? I think I found you on the Instagram originally. Where, where, do, where do people go to check out your stuff? Yeah, you can go to aerosparkmovement.com, E-R-O sparkmovement.com. Um, or emilyathena.com. And you do one-to-one -one stuff virtually for people listening. You do online classes. So that you know, people don't have to be in Oregon, God forbid, to do the job. Yeah, no, all, we do virtual. I do virtual. So um, yeah, you can be anywhere. Awesome. Well, thanks for hanging out. This has been a nice um, trialogue. Is that the word? A trialogue? <laughs> trialogue. <laughs> like a dialogue. Right, yeah. Like a trial of it. Oh, cool. yeah, three. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was going to go three, so I know it's too rude. It's too rude. So, trial of it. Now I've said it, it's too late. Um, anyway, pleasure. Emily, we just wanted to talk a bit about. So, thanks for the conversation. Lovely to get to know you a bit. And uh, yeah, cool. Keep in touch. Awesome. Bye. Bye. Bye.